Welcome and thank you for tuning in to the 412 Double Play Podcast. I am, as always, your host, Michael Castrigano. Joining me this week for part two of the Top 30 Prospects final member of the Two and a Half Gringos podcast and another member of the BOD squad, Bucks on Deck, Nola Jeffy. Hey, man, thank you for jumping on. Happy to finally get to meet you. I, I think we've interacted on Twitter or X, whatever it is, for a while now, at least. Yeah, uh, Pirates Twitter is pretty active. A lot of discussing, we'll call it, going on, especially <laughs> lately. So, no, I, I saw an interaction you got with uh, had earlier today with some, we'll say, uh, enthusiastic fans. <laughs> Sometimes it it doesn't always go the right way. But um, news for the Pirates: Aroldis Chapman signing made official, corresponding move DFA of outfielder Kanan Smith and Jigba, which was a bit divisive among fans, myself included. I, I'll admit I was uh, considering him being in the top 30, but decided to exclude him mostly because I kind of felt that this was coming. It didn't feel like the organization had that sort of enthusiasm for him that, that some of us fans felt. Crazy strong arm, uh, underrated speed, had a couple 20 stolen base seasons, excellent eye at the plate. He just couldn't seem to carve out a role when he got called up and didn't really rake enough at Indy to get a Miguel Andujar pull up at that point either. Now, were you a cannon, a canon baller, or did you see this transaction and say, CS, eh? I mean, I, I was a canon fan, um, but I guess when you kind of look at his profile as a hitter, it kind of mirrored a lot of similarities to other hitters that they just really haven't really gotten the best out of, I guess you could say. Because even like when you talk about like a Brian Hayes, a guy that you know hits the ball hard, but he hits the ball hard into the ground the whole time. With like Cannon, I mean, he's built like an NFL linebacker, running yep. back, whatever you want to call, and say, um, I mean, obviously he has the NFL bloodlines with his brother, and. Uh, he could hammer the ball. I mean, the raw strength was there. He just never really tapped into it and always had a great eye. But then when he got up to the MLB, just a lot of swing and miss, which really didn't exist in the minors, which was, so just was kind of odd in its own sense. So I'm not really surprised. I, I, will, I don't want to say I saw it coming necessarily, but I'm not surprised at the same time. He was, he was still it, interesting. Yeah, it, it just kind of felt like they had seen enough from him. And it didn't feel like he had a super long look in the bigs. It was pretty much mm -hmm. a fourth outfielder coming out of spring training. And he, he batted like 440, 460, something like that in spring last year. But you sit for a little bit, especially younger guys like that. I kind of felt like that was the worst thing for him. But you, you kind of have to play the hand your dealt and he wasn't able to really get moving when he was getting playing time yeah and it even so, seemed like he kind of changed his approach when he was in the mlb because again he was always like a great eye at the plate kind of guy watch sure. pitches put the ball in the play kind i mean but he was just i mean he had a i think what was it was either just under 40 or just over 40 percent strikeout rate which wasn't him. Yeah, it was in like so. Yeah, it it was like sixty some at bat, something like that. Like it wasn't. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't a huge sample size, and it felt like he was kind of pressing because mm -hmm. you know, pretty much first case of the bigs. I, he got a, a small taste, I think, in twenty twenty two, towards the end. Well, yeah, and then then he hurt his uh, what he only got hurt. maybe a couple, yeah, then his shoulder. Yeah. So, but other moves, at least within the division, the Brewers, they recently signed Reese Hoskins. That was a big move for them, a one and one you know, option year for uh, 2025 to play first base. And then they switch gears, trade Corbin Burns to the Orioles. They got some interesting prospects back. Uh, Joey Ortiz is, I think, ranked 57 or something like that in MLB Top 100. Um, DL Hall was a Top 100 prospect last year. And then they got the, I think, 34th overall pick, the, the comp A pick from the Orioles. And I think the initial 
view from fans was that this was a loss for the Brewers, but if they're actually going into sell mode and you know, potentially throwing another wrench into this division as far as like who's who's up to win it, um, it does this increase the chances of the Pirates being able to be in that like top kind of a long way away? I know we're talking about prospects on this episode, but like, how do you view this helped the, the Pirates' chances of winning a division? Um, I don't know. I'm not really. If it helps, I think it's only minorly. But um, the thing with the Brewers is, I mean, I guess, you know, they lost their, you know, ace. But at the same time, I mean, they've been developing pitchers pretty consistently over the years. I mean, uh, not, I almost said Wandy. Uh Freddie Peralta, which is funny. Yep. I, I still remember Freddie when he first came up. I mean, he was legit 80% fastball, just 80, fastball, 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 like the entire time. And it, it, he had like multiple fastballs too, and it was just, just straight fastball, but he could pinpoint it wherever he wanted to. So he made it work. And then if you look at like his pitch usage now, he's – drastically decreased. I mean, he's still heavily fastball, but not as much as he used to be. And yeah. I think he was, he was like 3.2, 3.5 war last year. Um, then obviously Burns. Um, so they, they haven't had problems developing pitchers. And now they have, I mean, they have Mizorowski in double A. They now have DL Hall, who, yeah, I mean, he was on the back. He made the back end, I want to say, uh, Baseball America's top 100 this year. Um. They also have Robert Gasser, who's another top 100 pitcher that was in AAA, sure. lefty. Um, then you look at just all the other prospects they have. I mean, they graduated, was it uh, Sal Freelich, Joey Weimer, all yeah. top 100 guys. Um, Garrett Mitchell was on a top 100 uh, momentarily. He got hurt. He, he was having a pretty good season before he got hurt. And then that's not even factoring, you know, they still got Kristen Yelich in left field and they added Reese Hoskins. So uh, if the Pirates gained on them, I don't know if it's that huge of a gain. It's just because the Brewers themselves, they're more similar to the Rays than we are, I guess you could say, and that they've been drafting, acquiring, developing, and they haven't really – I mean, that's not even – getting into Jackson Chirillo, who they already extended and should be starting yep. the majors. Oh, yeah. I, they announced, I think, today or yesterday he's going to be number 11. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, he's making opening day. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also this past week, another outlet dropped their top 100 prospects. Kylie McDaniel of ESPN posted his list. I guess it's the ESPN official one. Expected names, Paul Skeens at 7, Tamar Johnson 34, Jared Jones 53. And then a surprise for the fourth one for the Pirates within the top 100 at the end, right-handed pitcher Thomas Harrington at 98. So are other outlets underestimating Harrington, or is this a reach to appear ahead of guys like Solomito and Chandler? Um, I guess you could kind of argue either or um, because you could say kind of a reach in a sense that I know, like even us personally, we're really high on Bubba Chandler. Um, Solomato in his own sense has been doing really well. I mean, already making double A and didn't get blown away. Um, but also we're also pretty big Thomas Harrington fans. And I know some of the other lists themselves mentioned that he was like a just miss outlier kind of guy. Um, and we had previously mentioned that, you know, we could see him being someone that would pop up on lists, especially after he got to Greensboro. Cause we saw someone, we have some data on him when he was with Bradenton. There's some, uh, metrics with him, like on prospects live and the vertical approach angle on his fastball. was one of the things that we saw him. We we're like, Oh, okay. We, we didn't really know that he has a pretty strong, uh, fa- uh, carry on his fastball which works very well up in the zone and we you especially saw it when he got to greensboro he started 
getting even more swings and misses and strikeouts. So, and on top of that, he's got arguably the best control and command in the system of the pitchers. So he's, I think it's worth, not worth it, but uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, deserving. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't it, think it's a huge stretch, but. I, I thought it was interesting because I am torn as far as like which of the top four pitchers between Skeens, Jones, and in my mind, Solomito and Chandler has the best upside. So seeing Harrington on this list ahead of Solo and, and Chandler was kind of a surprise for me because I just, but then again, though they, they have high ceiling, but especially with Chandler, you know, he's, he's, he could fall apart. Solomito, the velocity isn't always there. Harrington kind of feels like a, I don't want to say like a Kyle Hendricks type, I'd rather say maybe like a Greg Maddox to pick another, I guess, Cub there. But mm -hmm. um, it, it just kind of feels like he's, like you said, with that control, not high velocity. But if the strikeouts can tick up from what they were in like the lower levels as he continues rising, that'll be interesting to see. Well, I think so obviously not kind of like, well, no, sorry. I was just going to say kind of like we were even talking pre-show about, you know, it's kind of personal feelings with and with someone like Harrington, with Bubba Solonetto and Jones, you, there's still risk there, in a sense. Mm -hmm. With you know, especially like Jones, like there's still a lot of reliever risk potential with him. With uh, a Harrington, he's probably a much more safer bet to go with, just because everything is above average with him, essentially. Like, yeah, it feels like his floor is back end rotation, whereas these other guys, right. there's not a guarantee. They'll even stick in the yeah. majors. Yeah. Which, you know, Pirates, given their development history, that's nice to have at least one. <laughs> because mm -hmm. we, we, they don't come around that often for us. No, no, not much. So, and we're not going to talk, obviously, in depth. Those, those guys are all in my top 10. Uh, today, we're going 20 through 11. So, jumping into that, starting off with number 20, I have Garrett Forrester. He's listed first base and third base. I think he only played first base last year uh, in, like, brief appearances. Third-round pick by the Pirates in 2023. Strong but abbreviated appearance in Bradenton. Five for 18, 10 walks to seven strikeouts. Uh, before that, solid collegiate career, Oregon State. He won the Pac-12 tournament MVP in 2022. Had a 341, 45, 522 triple slash in his final year. Um, so college, obviously great, small appearance in Bradenton where he was a little bit older than some of his peers. Are fans getting ahead of themselves over hype with him or can they not see to have another pun in, in this, the forester for the trees? I like that. Um, I like that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's kind of funny uh, going into him with him uh, just actually talking about uh, Ken Smith and Jigba because uh, Forrester himself is, you know, an on-base machine. Because, yep. um, yeah, I mean, he carried above a 480 OBP sophomore junior year and then Bradenton at a 552 OBP. <clears throat> and uh, then he's another, you know, contact oriented hitter contact over power but you know with his size and already they're saying you know it's likely he's just a first base only prospect and uh which would be nice to have because we don't have a lot of those especially sure. ones with much uh upside but then again you talk about like a map of nunez he's also another you know contact over he has a lot of raw power but he's also more contact uh Yay! patient hitter and uh, but Forrester, young kid, a nice all fields approach. If he if they can get more power out of him, as we say with a lot of these guys, I think he's another one with uh, a lot more upside if they can tap into that power. So, does he have like I, I, I don't want to use this comp because you know, given that he's towards the end of his career, but a Joey Votto type because I think he usually hit like 20, 25 home runs, 
and, and even in his MVP season, I think he only hit like 27, 28 maybe, but got on base, 400 plus clip almost every year. Um, mm -hmm. Is it okay to like have that kind of value in a guy who could get on base? Uh, I remember back in like the 2013 to 2015 run, they would sign someone like Ike Davis who didn't have a ton of pop or they traded for him. I think with the Mets didn't have a ton of pop, but he got on base at like 370 clip or something like that. Um, is that the kind of route that Forrester could be taking on his way to potentially playing in the majors one day? I mean, I, I think it's a pretty decent comp. Um, I was even just now just thinking, you know, like a less versatile Jared Triolo in a sense, you know, because he's another uh, high OBP uh, contact guy. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously Forrester, although I, I, well, I was reading through one of the reports and they said that some teams actually had tried him behind the plate pre-draft um, just to see how he worked back there. But, yeah, it, it, he's probably likely a first base option especially with some of the younger kids they have in the lower levels i mean they got guys that are going to push off a shortstop and probably have to go to third so there won't be a lot of time there but yeah yeah i you could probably a high obp 15 20 home runs is probably his upside again if they tap into that power which is i guess something i was more going to talk about later in the list okay you, what, you, you know the names, you don't know the order, so let's go to the next one. Uh, highly touted prospect uh, on many lists last year. I think maybe it's fallen off a bit. Number 19 for me is Jordani De Los Santos, shortstop and third baseman. He was signed as one of the top international prospects in 2022 signing period. Still 18. Uh, he turns 19 in, I think, two weeks, something like that. As I mentioned, was at the top of some pirate prospect charts entering last year. Kind of a mixed bag. His time at the complex, he had 78 plate, appearance, plate appearances over 17 games, generated a 328, 397, 463 line, 13 stolen bases and 14 attempts. But then they pushed him to Bradenton. It kind of exposed some holes in his game. 153 plate appearances, strikeout rate 39.2%, sub 600 OPS in that span. So, Nola, the power's there. The speed is mm -hmm. there. What are your thoughts on De Los Santos being able to improve going forward and, and kind of put things together with as he rises through the minor league? He's definitely, I mean, especially uh, given the age. Yeah, he's only 18, going to be, like you said, 19 uh, in like two weeks. So he'll play the whole season at 19, already in A ball and. He's definitely a kid that you watch him, and the tools are definitely there. He's looks like a ball player, like a probably you know a kid that you would see and be like, yeah, that kid's a ball player. Just and very athletic, power. Mm -hmm. He he could stick at shortstop easily, but okay. you know, he's someone that even that probably could even slide over to third base, no problem. Um, but. It, his biggest issue, which is a lot of, especially like the younger kids, when you watch them as they ascend in the majors or not the major, the minors, especially coming from like complex league and like the DSL and all that, like once they start seeing better quality breaking balls, it's a lot of times hard for them to adjust, especially if we talk about someone like a Edward Moika, who, you know, Remember all the buzz about him I don't know, two years ago yeah. when he was blowing it up and then he got to Bradenton and couldn't touch a curveball, you know. So that'll be one of the main things to watch this upcoming season with him. I mean, again, he's only 19. Time is on his side. It's not someone you want to rush. Um, but that'll be something to keep an eye on is how well is he handling breaking pitches? Is he seeing them? Um, or is he just free swinging at everything? And you mentioned about like curveballs that these players who have mostly played in complex league in, you know, I don't want to say like backyards, but the, mm -hmm. in the DSL, stuff like that. Um, 
how big is the jump from that level of play to a ball where it, it is a lot of like, you know, international prospects who are coming in a lot of high schoolers, but then you have some journeymen, you have some collegiate uh, pitchers that are coming in there. Is he getting a lot of off speed stuff that it, you could say, okay, well, that's why he's not used to seeing this stuff. That's why his strikeout rate is almost 40%. But I, I mean, a lot of the lo, uh, low, low levels, I mean, you'll, you'll see guys, you know, because throwing high heat's not something that's rare nowadays. <clears throat> and even in like the DSL, you got guys that are, you know, their third season that are a little old for the league, like even 19, 20 year olds. And we're talking about teenagers here that are still growing into their bodies. So bulking up and everything. So it can be a, guys that don't even have the best control or command of their pitches all they're doing is just throwing um so a hitter of his capability can take advantage especially if you're just fastball hunting but you you see it as they move up because we could even go back to talking about like a uh, florencio and flores um when they were in bradenton themselves i mean they out they obliterated the FSL league with their breaking pitches and they just had a modicum of control of it that they hitters couldn't touch it in Br in Bradenton, but you know, they got mm -hmm. to Greensboro where it's just, you know, the hitters are a little better and they both haven't made it out of Greensboro. And I think Florence home this all last year, but yeah, they just got tagged once they moved up to a uh, high a, so there, there's definitely a variance not, not uh, in all the pitching that they're going to see as they climb the ladder. And that's why you see even like a Dominic Parachi that the Pirates drafted uh, two drafts ago didn't throw very hard and he had a huge loopy curveball, but he always had great strikeout rates as a lefty, like a soft toss and lefty just because you can put it where you want it. You know, these kids aren't, really used to seeing that or, or especially seeing like lefties very often. So yeah. you can get by with, got the, some, with the, like... Yeah, it's got some big name drops here. Florencio and, and Flores and Parachi, who mm -hmm. I think is pretty much is, is he strictly in the bullpen now? I think he was in uh no I think he, he was mostly a starter. Okay. Yeah I I'd have to go back and look starter Let's you, see you follow the minor years. leagues way closer yeah. than I do. Yeah. I just don't have the time for it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't I yeah. have as much time as I used to, but so Mur Murph is number sure. one on that now. I know. It's, I know it. he's, he's usually my first uh, message about that stuff. Uh, all right, let's move on with this list. We got a lot of guys to cover here. So number 18, this one might be a bit contentious, but I've got Jace Bowen. Outfielder, first baseman, kind of played a couple other positions, but those are the two that he's mostly listed for. 2019 11th round pick out of high school. He parlayed a strong season at Greensboro into becoming a name that fans know this past offseason. Uh, 2020 season with the Grasshoppers, 493 plate appearances, 23 home runs, 24 stolen bases, 802 OPS. Obviously versatile defensively, 10 plus games at each outfield spot and first base. That said, as I'm probably going to say a bunch of times this episode, and I said last episode, Greensboro is a hitting haven. Mostly his lefty-righty splits make it uh, less likely that he can be a full-time player long-term. He had a 957 OPS against Southpaws, 776 against right-handed pitchers. He did get a cup at Altoona to end the year, just eight games, but looked pretty overmatched. Arizona Fall League bounce back uh, i think he was like second or, yeah he finished like runner up in the home run derby uh, was near the top in a bunch of different categories statistically um it but th that's kind of a mixed bag at the afl too because sometimes guys are working on stuff sometimes you're facing guys who haven't made it out of low a ball and they're just trying to figure mm -hmm. stuff out so with bowen making that jump from green throw to altoona Strikeout and walk rates weren't great, but you know, I've seen worse on this. Is 
we got another pun here. Is this another bust about to happen, or are you going with Bowen in 2024? <laughs> um, that might be the last one. I have to check my notes. Oh, no, I think you should bring more. I'll just, just make them up as I go along. Yeah, All right, I, I like so them. Bowen, though. Um, I'll, I'll say I, I'm kind of going with Bowen. Um, I'm a little attentive just because, uh, obviously, with some of the recent, you know, the Frazier, Gorski, the other uh, outfielders. Uh, what I like about Bowen um, is I he was kind of in a group of similar outfielders in Greensboro when you, you were like Hudson Head, Sammy Ciani, and Jace Bowen. You had three big power, a lot of strikeouts athletic kids um but last year was probably the first time that uh bowen actually kind of started nailing down a position because he was playing began to start primar primarily playing center field and again over two very pretty quality defensive outfielders themselves in the head and siani <clears throat> and even in the arizona fall league he was you know getting time out there so I believe they like him very much as a center fielder. He can handle it. Um, the one one thing I did like seeing in his repeat of Greensboro was his uh, strikeout percentage dropped about 8% from 32 to like 24 and a half. I'd like to see more walks. Um, that That's generally below 10% for him. Mm -hmm. You'd like to see some more there. Um, but – and especially as of late, to me, it's it's really hard to trust hitters much and to truly gauge how much upside they have until they hit Altoona and we want to see what they do in Altoona. Because even talking about Bray Bradenton's a pretty hitter friendly park too. Greensboro is obviously that's, it's not. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's more because of the wind, though. Because the wind could be blowing yeah. anyway. You you might hit a pop fly one day that's a home run the next day. Right. <clears throat> um, but yeah, no, it's it's down the line is so shallow in Greensboro. Um mm. is so what and I, I don't want to like give away who my next name would be, what would prevent Bowen from falling into the category of some failed I don't want to say failed prospects because they're still obviously in the system, but guys who mm -hmm. haven't achieved that level of success as they moved from high A to double A? Like, is there anything athletically or uh, swing decisions, ability to recognize breaking pitches that would put him above or, or give more assurances to him? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's really, yeah, it's just all going to come down to the consistency of contact he makes once he's in double A, recognizing pitches and making more consistent contact because yeah a lot of the guys as they moved up you know, as we keep to, you know kept saying i was saying earlier just once they start seeing better pitches you know pitchers with better stuff better command put the ball wherever they want <clears throat> like you're not gonna you gotta be able to lay off some pitches in the dirt and can't just be free swinging at everything and you know, I so as with just yeah, the other guys, it's a lot of it's going to come down to you know making more, more consistent contact because all, all the it's another guy. It's just all the tools are there. He's got pop. He's got speed. He's strong defensively. You just put the ball in place some more consistently. Yeah, yeah. You don't want him to end up like another. Guy who actually have next, next on my list, you mentioned already, uh, number 17, Matt Gorski, also listed outfielder and first baseman. For me, this placement may be a little bit of favoritism. I think he's higher on my list than some others, but I still see something in him. Second round pick from 2019, taken out of Indiana University, kind of last year's Jace Bowen. 2022, combined for 24 home runs, 21 stolen bases, 956 OPS, over 81 games. Technically, four... Minor league ball 
five games at Lowy Bradenton and a single game at AAA Indianapolis, mostly Greensboro a bit at Altoona. Um, solid numbers there uh, in 2022. Last season, spent most of the year in Altoona, noticeably regressed, totaled a 725 OPS between there and Indianapolis. He did notch another 2020 season, another speedy, power hitting, uber athletic dude in a way kind of the opposite of Bowen as far as like the splits, both right-handed hitters, but Gorski has a 347 OPS against lefty pitching last year and 870 against right-handed pitching. So is Gorski another mentioned before Matt Frazier, Mason Martin, or is there still a chance that his athleticism gets him over the hump and um, puts him in, in, conversation he already got a non-roster invite for spring training the potential that he could be in consideration as a depth option especially now that they're starting to eliminate guys like smith and jigba um what are your thoughts on gorski even in comparison to bowen well i mean i feel like you uh kind of said a lot then just there, there, there is quite a bit of similarities just in that, yeah, very toolsy. <clears throat> I mean, he's a big boy, too. I mean, um, listed 62198, I think, and uh, probably one of the better, best, arguably the best center field prospect defensively they have. Yep. Um, I know they were trying him at first base for some time. Um, but he's he can definitely handle center field, and that's why I, I was hoping he could catapult himself to the majors. Because um, yeah, it's very very raw, high upside type tools. It's just again, you know, it comes down to making contact. It, ironically, his he dropped his strike like strikeout rate uh, in Double A by almost yeah, about four percent. But also the already not very strong walk rate dropped as well. It wasn't even yep. 7%, but he still had like a 200 ISO. But, you know, the 238 batting average, uh, OBP under 300 is just going to be someone that, you know, when he hits it, it's he's hitting it deep, 17 home runs in Altoona, which is definitely not not cheap. It's not a, yeah. not a big home run park, so <clears throat> yeah. No, I'd like to see him put it how many guys struggle when they get there. Yeah. Now he's Bowen's probably going to be starting. I mean, speculating, but probably going to be the starting center fielder in Altoona. Gorski mm -hmm. looks like he's going to be slated to start center field in Indianapolis. Does that put him on a path? I mean, given those the splits, they're kind of going the wrong direction. If you have them flipped, potentially a platoon partner or defensive backup even for mm -hmm. um, Sawinski at the majors, but 870 against right-handed pitching is pretty strong at any level. I I is mm -hmm. there some sort of a route for him, especially given that defense, to even get a, a cup at some point this season? Or do you see him getting lapped by other, I don't want to say more deserving, but other prospects that the team maybe is more interested in seeing more of? Well, I guess the thing there is uh, at this point, there's not really much in terms of outfield prospects to really lap them right now. So <clears throat> uh, we, we still don't know. We won't know yet, I guess, maybe for at least a couple of days if Cannon is getting claimed or not. I mean, they recently signed McKinney and Celestino, who are probably going to get time in the outfield. Right. Well, will. But, you know, so there'll probably be some kind of like rotation type deal. Um, he'll probably even maybe get some time at first base, but I mean, you got Joe Perez and, you know, Seth Beer, Malcolm Nunez. So there'll probably be a lot of rotation going on. And he just, if he hit, hits the crap out of the ball, he could maybe find his way up because, I mean, Let's be honest. In, injuries are going to happen. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> At some point. So he just has to put himself 
in the back of their minds for when an opening happens. Yeah, it's pretty much what I think he's going to have to do. And, and potentially if, I mean, you're, you're hoping it's not going to happen, but if an outfielder gets injured or they, they make a move where, you know, Josh Palacios is no longer one of the guys that they're relying on heavily, he potentially yeah. could get the call up, but. Well, um, and even speaking on that, I mean, you have Jack Sawinski and Brian Reynolds, which are, you know, your shirt starters. And yeah, that's, I didn't want to mention, you know, one of them getting injured. I'm going to knock on wood yeah, for that. Yeah, <laughs> but that's not even past them. No, I mean, obviously, Kutch isn't like or is likely to not play outfield very much. Um, mm-hmm. All of ours is even himself kind of like a we're not sure. He, you imagine he's the starting right fielder or even maybe Palacios. Who knows? I mean, Palacios might have one of those Kevin Newman type springs that Castillo, Madrid, Cannon had, and he gets the starting right field job. So maybe he seems yeah. to like him a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see on that. Uh, geez, only two weeks until couple, three weeks, three weeks until spring training games. Uh, we can have until pitchers and catchers report, but um, <laughs> we're moving on here. Number 16, which I have listed for Mitch Jeb, who is middle infielder, second base shortstop, speedy second rounder out of Michigan state in 2023 unorthodox swing. If you've ever seen video of it, you know, <laughs> but he makes it work, made it work in Bradenton last year, 34 games, 153 plate appearances, <laughs> Batted 297 on base, percentage of 382, walked more than he struck out, went 11 for 12 at stolen base attempts. But I'm just conflicted as to whether or not that level of play continues as the level of competition escalates. He doesn't hit for power, which I think kind of lowers his overall ceiling. He posted some strong numbers in college played Cape Cod League in 22 and was one of the best performers there, which we know Charrington has shown to highly value how players do there. Mm -hmm. But MLB Pipeline, currently they don't have the updated rankings, but as of 2023, end of season, they had Mitch Jeb as seventh on their Pirates prospect list. I have him 16. Who, who, I don't want to say who's more right, but um, how do you value him either between those two or in a completely different spot entirely? Um, I probably value him uh, more towards the top 10 or maybe even, and even within the top 10, just because um, he's a very, very, very safe bet to make the majors just with his skill set as it stands. <clears throat> um, he, uh, yeah, as you said, he doesn't hit the ball very hard frequently. Um, yeah, I think his max EV in Bradenton was 106.1 miles per hour, but his average was 79.8. Um, yep. But he don't, his swinging strike percentage was 2.7%, which led the Pirates minor leaguers by, by quite a bit. I mean, there were, there were some lower guys, you know, like six, seven percent, but that that's a very low number. So he doesn't swing and miss. He he's going to make contact and put the ball in play. Uh, they likely won't, but I'd be curious to see if maybe they try and tweak the swing a little bit, generate a little more power out of it. I know they've talked about even pushing him into center field, seeing a lot of center field time. He's obviously very fast, very, very fast. Uh, And I guess the hope would be that maybe he could be kind of like a Stephen Kwan for the Guardians, who um, there was a Fangraphs article on him about how, like, he doesn't barrel the ball or get like a hard hit percent, like a hard hit very frequently, but he hits the ball Mm -hmm. like in that 80 range so frequently that he gets a lot of, you know, line drive hits, doubles out of it because they're very high success rate types of balls in play. So, yeah, that's probably the kind of player you'd hope he turns into given his skill set. Yeah, uh, it looks like he's got 80 grade speed, 
on the 2080 scale, which is crazy. I don't know what his actual sprint speed is, but uh, if he ends up being someone like... He's the lefty hitter, right? Yeah, of course he is. If he ends up being someone like Ichiro and just getting a bunch of infield singles now that there's no shift, like maybe that's the kind of career he has. Uh, Stephen Kwan is is an interesting comp, and I, I could see how that fits. What is the ceiling for a guy like Jeb as far as stat lines? I'm assuming, you know, maxing at like 10, 15 home runs if he plays in like cores on steroids, but <laughs> like as far as doubles on base percent, like what, what would be his upside long term? I mean, yeah, you're probably looking at a high batting average, high OBP, you know, mid mid three hundreds, higher. Um, a lot of stolen bases. I mean, 30, 40 plus. But yeah, you're probably talking single digit home runs, maybe a maybe a good year, double digit, because he hit, you know, a handful at Great American Ballpark, or uh, they took a tour to the Astrodome. <clears throat> you put a couple out. Um. Yeah, but but it, it's gonna be a guy that hits a lot of doubles. So probably even another comp would probably be like a Luis Arias type hitter because he, he okay. he's kind of similar to the Quan too, and that you're not gonna get a lot of home runs out of him, but they're gonna get on base and they're gonna get on base a lot. And yeah, you know, and steal out for batting title year in year out. Mm-hmm. All right, so mm-hmm. that's interesting. Maybe I'll have to uh, relook at this at least by end of season when I make my predict uh, my picks for next year. Right now, sixteen. But moving on to number fifteen, uh, left-handed pitcher Jackson Wolf. So I only have the one player on this list who has any MLB experience. I mentioned CSN probably would have made the list, but um, kind of figured the trajectory he was on. Wolf's brief stint with the Padres last year, just a spot start, five innings, six hits, three runs, walk and a strikeout. Came over to the Pirates as part of a deadline deal, sent G-Man Choi and Rich Hill to SoCal, and he pitched almost exclusively in double-A ball last year. Despite being six foot seven, he's a bit of a soft tosser. Mm-hmm. Reaches low 90s with a fastball. He went to West Virginia for college. He's from Ohio originally, so it's a little bit closer to home now, even being in Altoona. Good control walk rate last year, 6.4%. It's gotten bit a bit by the long ball, but his whip was 1.11 over 124.1 innings last year. So that's pretty respectable. But my question for you, Jackson Wolf, Jackson Holiday, Jackson Churio, who is the best left-handed pitcher of the three? <laughs> the best left-handed pitcher of the three? Uh, uh, yes, that's um, that's what I'm gonna. And then you're because then you know it's it's pretty it's pretty clearly they're the better prospect. Oh, oh. well, just I mean, I, <laughs> no. I, if that's the question, if that's the question, I almost want to say Jackson question. Holiday, Jackson Holiday, because he's the kid's just a freak of a nature. So he's just so <laughs> he's so athletic, he'll switch hands and still throw better. Yeah. Yeah, probably somehow. <laughs> um, so Jackson Wolf kind of made a, a, a comp earlier. We were talking about Thomas Harrington, who mm-hmm. doesn't throw that hard but has good control. Jackson Wolf, similar vein. Are there any realistic comps between Wolf and Harrington? Between Wolf and Harrington, uh, I, I don't know if necessarily between them because I, I know, like, one of the things that makes Wolf. Uh, one of the reasons why his stuff kind of plays better than the like 89 90 uh average he touches, and maybe he'll add a couple ticks in the offseason, we'll see. But he has like very like elite extension off the mound. Uh, the very limited data in the majors had about seven and a half feet extension, which is a very high n- a number. Yep. Um, so that, that, what that does is that helps like the fastball, you know, it's all, it's coming in at 89, but you know, as they say that, you know, the it's perceived coming in faster. So an 89 will look 92, 93 as they'll sometimes talk about with like pitchers that maybe don't throw that hard. Um, 
he obviously also has a little bit of a weird delivery himself, which is in part probably, you know, I don't know if there's going to be find much more velocity in there, but you never know. Um, one, one of the things I found kind of interesting was that his K percentage dropped coming to Pittsburgh, like almost like 10%. Yeah. But yeah, and his, his swing and strike percentage was 10.8, which isn't great. You want to see a little more on that, especially a funky lefty. That's a, obviously going to be more of a finesse type. But part of me feels with some of the recent uh, draft picks, acquisitions, because throwing in like even Bailey Falter in there, I almost it almost feels like they're kind of going for a type all of a sudden now. Because even I mean, uh, Martin Perez is a bit of a soft tossing lefty. Marco Gonzalez is a soft tossing lefty. You look yeah. at some of these other uh, draft picks. Your uh, Jaden Woods, he's like a low nineties, but throws like a high two seamer because it, rather it, it's not so much a sinker. It'll be like tracked as a sinker, but it's more of a two seamer because it's a lot flatter than a sinker, which will play better up in the zone, but also have more run on it, like into like towards a right-handed hitter we'll say so well actually wait, i think i said that wrong that'd be cut but yeah oh, okay they're, yeah they're, they're good they're getting uh uh so like into a left-hander i guess yeah um but they're getting a lot of these lower 90s lefties but that throw a lot of like two seamers up in the zone i think even kennedy I can't remember. He was a two seam guy. <clears throat> yeah. I don't have him on my list this week, so I haven't done sufficient research yet. Um, possibly. Again, Murph's probably the one <laughs> you'd, you'd ask on that. But um, yeah, no. So with what you were saying, like um, Rich Hill, they got last year another soft tossing mm -hmm. lefty. Uh, Jose Quintana, his. his velocity you know years prior was a bit higher than it was with us he was probably still like low 90s at least uh tyler anderson though before that so it does kind of seem like they have that proclivity what kind of major league comp is there for jackson wolf being a, a six seven southpaw who doesn't really throw that hard i mean he, his, his delivery is not quite as funky as someone like Salamito, who's obviously not in the bigs, but like someone that the, the fans could be like, oh, okay, if he is on a similar trajectory to player, you know, ABC, who who do you see most in Wolf, if anyone? Kind of putting you on the spot with that, but. That's it. I'm, I'm trying to wreck my brain for someone that. Because honestly, I, I'd almost even say probably. Although it wouldn't get people excited. <laughs> like I was just, just mentioning Bailey Falter. Uh, but yeah, it, it, a six, seven, I, I don't know. There's nothing that really comes to mind at, at the jump right now. But I will say I did look up Kennedy and yeah, he, it, it's a lot of two seamers up in the zone. Yeah. Not, not no, to deflect still, too much. Kennedy's still younger. I think Jackson Wolf's like what? 25, 26. Kennedy yeah. was drafted out of high school a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I was uh, just saying, like, in, in terms of, like, the profiling of, like, their pitches and type of stuff they're throwing. That's, sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's just right. weird that he's, again, like you said, because of his extension being 6'7", getting, like, so we saw that with uh, Angel Perdomo last year. Didn't throw mm. all that hard, but it just felt so much harder for the hitters because he was like six nine, and so it was coming in way faster. Mm -hmm. So, um, ideally, I, I don't want to say like Wolf ends up in that kind of a role, but I, I think like as a floor, that's not bad to be a lefty reliever who can pitch one inning and, and be successful. Just because his walk mm. rate's so good, I just kind of hope that he finds a little bit more like a even third, fourth starter mm -hmm. because there's more value in that, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll I mean, move yeah, I'd say the, 
Well, I was just going to say, yeah, the upside, I'd say, is probably back-end starter. but Which is we'll, fine. We'll see. Because it, yeah. if you got to figure, like, this is my third time I'm making this list. I know uh, you guys on Two and a Half Gringos a couple years ago um, had done the same thing. That was part of my inspiration for it. And you look at some of the names back then, and it's like, yeah, these guys either didn't make the majors or made it and were terrible. So if they got if they end up being a back end starter, that's not a that's not the worst thing because it's yeah. a crapshoot with prospects. And that's why someone like I was just saying with like Jeb, if he just making it itself is good. Yeah. Yeah, it's man, that swing is just so funky. Oh, we got so many guys with like funky something mm. <laughs> up and down the system. But moving on to number 14, uh, right here I've got Shang Shi Chang, shortstop, second base, I mean middle infield as well. 2019 international signing, potential future short king middle infielder for the Bucks. Chang is contact oriented speedster, went off in Greensboro last year. It's a hitting haven. 57 mm-hmm. games, 254 plate appearances, triple slash, 308, 406, 575. Then he gets promoted to Altoona, and as is common when players make that jump, declines significantly. And imme- Well, not immediately. I think his first month there was, was actually pretty solid. But um, 66 games in total in Altoona, 281 plate appearances, uh, triple slash, 251, 304, 352. Not terrible. But his walk rate dropped from 13.8 down to 6%. The then manager at Altoona, Calix Crab, has spoken highly of Chang. He's obviously very athletic, uh, strong defensively. But similar to Jeb, it seems like his ceiling may be a bit limited by his power output or lack thereof. So uh, Nola Cheng was moved to the 40 man ahead of the Rule 5 draft this offseason. Are mm-hmm. you buying or selling on him as a long-term future player on this team? Um, I'll, I'll buy him as a future player in some capacity. Um, Cause yeah, he, he can handle, you know, the, all the middle infield positions. Um, it, it, it was funny. Cause we did, we, we did a podcast leading up to the year last year with uh, Eric Birdland and we were, we specifically spoke on Chang and how we were like, just be careful with how hyped you get on him during the year because especially with his swing, it's going to play very well in Greensboro. But then he's going to hit Altoona, and that power output's going to drastically drop because it's, it's a swing designed for gap power drop it in the gap and run because he's, he's another kid that, you know, just really put fast. the bomb playing. He's fast. He's so fast. But I, I, I've seen him run into a couple. I think, what was it, that uh, the World Baseball Classic last – it was last year. And he played for, I want to say, Chinese Taipei. And he, he ran Chinese into Taipei a couple. From, yeah, yeah he, he ran into a couple. Like, he put one over the center fielder's head to the warning track and – and it, it would stand up triple because he's so fast. And what? Yes, he stole twenty six bases last year. But I'm pulling the stats up now because I didn't have them. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, twenty six, thirteen, thirteen in Greensboro, and then thirteen in Altoona. In smaller sample size, but yeah. you know, in Altoona he wasn't getting four baggers, one swing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think the best thing that can happen to the development in this organization is for them to just completely leave Greensboro or just redesign the park because it gives like an undue expectation that their power output is going to continue as they move up. Yeah, because even and... <laughs> uh, it, it turned Lolo Sanchez and Jared Triolo into sluggers and... Uh, I, even one of the things we used to we would look at be like, okay, well, what's their road OPS at least or road slugging? And even then, it's still a toss up because you got like Asheville, which is another the whole home yeah the happy. whole league is a mess. <laughs> yeah, that. so uh, it's it's hard to determine that kind of stuff. Um, I I don't think I have too much more to talk about with Cheng. Uh, I think that 
like I said, the defense alone could make him a valuable utility piece, kind of in that, that mm -hmm. same vein. Triolo can be versatile. I don't know defensively what he's played outside of shortstop second base. If they've, I don't want to say tried him in the outfield, but if that's something that they would be interested in, um, I think it's mostly been second shortstop, a little bit in third a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. um, is he more like jack of all trades, master of none? utility guy or should he be someone that the team long-term tries to find a spot tries to like if he becomes like a, a speedy second baseman either holding that spot until Mitch Jeb is there or um shortstop if Cruz can't stick like what should his role be <laughs> well my personal feelings are that uh I, I kind of wanted them to test other avenues with Cruz previously, but part of the issue was, you know, they just didn't have, there was no shortstop prospects really pushing them off the position. So there was, in that sense, there was really no reason to. Um, maybe if Chang, I was just, that's difficult to say because I was going to say, maybe if Chang has like a, a solid, I guess we could say second tour of Altoona and starts like really hitting and getting into that gap power and bringing everything up, uh, bringing his walk rate back up, you know, hitting a bunch of doubles, lugging out triples with his speed, that maybe they leave him at – they might they, – there's a good chance they would leave him at shortstop all the way up to AAA and then just kind of decide from there because even second base, I mean, Tamar's right there. So likely not – that, that's not going to really be an option. Yeah, at this point, and, I don't think, and I, there's not like a top shortstop at AAA either. If he when he moves up, if he moves up, how dare you sure. talk about Alika Williams like that? I I haven't he, he he could be my no he's not my top ten. <laughs> he probably does not still have prospect status, but yeah, he does because uh, was Baseball America ranked? Or, no, who was it? Somebody ranked? Was it Baseball America ranked him like? 26th and everyone was like what i mean his, his defense is really good and mm -hmm. he's raked at triple a he just it, it's a situation you get in where you get to the bigs and you can't like you, you look at his numbers in indianapolis last year it's like oh okay this yeah. guy could hit he just uh, doesn't do it with pittsburgh for a moment there i was like oh my gosh here here's the here's the pirates uh hitting development they're their crown jewel. Here's here's the guy they finally fixed, and then he got to piss with yep. like, Never mind. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Never mind. For, all for Robert Stevenson, who come on, there's no way he's gonna turn around and uh, never trade with the Rays. All right, moving on to number 13. I've got right-handed pitcher Braxton Ashcraft. Uh it's kind of a week of former second rounders here. Ashcraft was second round pick 2018 out of Robinson High School in Waco, Texas, famous for just great pitchers and nothing else. Uh, between losing 2020 season due to COVID, much of 2021, all of 2022, and most of 2023 due to Tommy John recovery, he's had a suboptimal journey through development, totaled just 162 innings over parts of four seasons. But last year, through three levels, uh, ending the year in Altoona, 2.39 ERA, 1.08 whip, 52.2 innings, 63 strikeouts to 11 walks. Fastball was up to 97, slider in the high 80s. At worst, he seems like he's got the upside of it. I don't want to say at worst upside, but it seems like he could be a back-end bullpen arm. But what what is his upside? A lot of people get really excited about Braxton Ashcraft as far as like, oh, this guy's going to be you know a two or three in a rotation someday. I just haven't seen enough of him to, for me to say, oh, yeah, that's plausible. Is, is it plausible, or is that a pipe dream for fans? Uh, I guess uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a big, big uh, Ashcraft fan. Um, I'd say it's plausible mm -hmm. in the sense that <clears throat> if he can prove this year that he can maintain his stuff for five, six innings, velocity and everything – I mean, 
he's I'm very excited about him. Like w- watching him pitch last year, it was just especially being after Tommy John, like he came back, yeah, just pumping 97 and then got all the way to the Altoona. And you thought you would think like, okay, he's in Altoona now. He's just coming back from Tommy John. He's probably going to get roughed up a bit. And I think he only gave up five earned runs. It was all in one outing. Like his, he's got three pitches, his fastball slider and curve that he, he's got fantastic control. And command like he, he was putting it wherever he wanted whenever he wanted yeah. and guys were just whiffing on everything and it was just like wow like this guy was just came back and it's like he didn't miss a beat but the problem was you know once he was getting deeper in games the velocity started dropping and then that's when people started tag or at least getting better contact and fouling off pitches and <clears throat> walks and stuff, but because yeah, uh, I think the Baseball America write up said that his slider is plus potential, along with like the fastball and then the curveball is above average. He had a cutter and changeup that were more just kind of toss in there every now and then pitches. But uh, mm-hmm. I, if he can show that he can maintain his stuff for five, six innings, he's – I really like him a lot. Yeah. And as you mentioned, coming back from Tommy John was a bit limited. Uh, maxed out at four innings. Uh, I think the most batters he faced was 18, and that was at Greensboro in his last start. So it, it's it's going to be interesting to see – like you said, how he does going a little bit deeper into games. Is is he someone who they will be moving into the rotation this year? Or because he only had the 52, 52.2 innings last year, is he still going to be so limited that they maybe either have him like, I mean, possibly once a week starter, but are they going to be working him as a starter slash reliever to kind of control those innings? Uh, I guess it kind of depends, um, because um, if you want to look at uh, Aaron Shortridge, he came back from Tommy John and his first year back in twenty two, he threw sixty four point one innings, <clears throat> and then in twenty twenty three, he threw one hundred and forty three point one. So it, it's gonna be one of those things. It's just like it's gonna depend on Braxton and his body and being honest with coaches and everything and just how I mean, he's, he's a big Texan boy. So hopefully sure. he had a strong, a strong, healthy off season pulling tractors and stuff. But, uh, uh we'll see. I, I'm curious to see where he begins. If they'll stick him in the Altoona just to kick off the year, if they'll jump him in the Indy to, for a spot there and, well, he's on the 40 man. He's already going to be in Bradenton. Uh, geez, next week, technically, he could probably be there, if not already yeah. there. So uh, he'll have an opportunity and an opportunity to appear in games this season. Yeah. And I mean, there's, I'll be curious to see how much movement there is this year. Cause obviously, I mean, we have Keller, Perez, and Gonzalez, which are, you know, we could say those three are. As best as we can say, those three are set in stone. The last yep. two spots, it's a lot of names. And there could be a lot of movement. Yeah, definitely throughout the course of the season. We got some names who could be coming up. I'm sure I'll be mentioning them next week. But right now, I'm looking at number 12, a guy who is very far off. And I've got right-handed pitcher Xander Muth. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Only player on this list who has yet to debut. Muth was drafted comp B round in 2023. Pirates gave him a 1.8 million signing bonus to pull him away from his old Mills, old Miss commitment. Fastball low to mid 90s, low 80s slider, mid 80s changeup. Uh, from the complex, there's been some reports that his control is a bit of an issue, but he's only 18, hasn't thrown professional games yet, just in camp. Um, so possible that could develop out good build for a starting pitcher six six 205 pounds uh 
I next to nothing about him. So what, if anything, have you guys at Bucks on Deck heard about him and his potential in this notably pitching heavy system? Well, we, uh, Murph was, uh, had, I found a YouTube stream of some of the, uh, what is it? Not, not complex games, but the, uh, de- like the, uh, development camp games. I, I forget the specific okay. name. Um, so we actually did get to catch a, uh, some glimpse of him and it actually ha- even had like data on him. Um, and I'll say, um, on the stream. Very, yeah, there, there was a stream. Yeah. And it, it had, it had a bunch of different metrics and we saw some of the metrics he was putting out and we're just like, wait, what? And, we're very excited for him because he, he's got like a lower arm slot, hits upper 90s, relative ease, and he himself has like a very flat two seamer that he was just like spotting up up in the zone that and then pairing out with the slider that he's he's gonna give uh batters fits with the type of stuff he has. But yeah, control will be a main thing to keep an eye on with him. He's he's someone I could see dominating the lower levels rather easily if he's finding the zone. But even if he's not finding the zone, he's got, he might be one of those guys that he's either going to walk or strike you out. There's really so there's Nolan no Ryan, Justin Verlander type early career. <laughs> yeah. um, so, but what you were saying that he was spotting the two seamer up in the zone is mm-hmm. the control issues more on like the slider and other, you know, off speed stuff. Well, I, I guess I should say he spot a couple up there. It, it, it was only a couple innings, so it's hard to say. Yeah. Um, it's not like we saw. Uh, like a dozen innings and he was doing it consistently. It was a couple innings and he just threw a couple balls up in the zone where it was just like that, that pitch is going to be a problem. If, if, if he's able to put that pitch there consistently at his velocity, it's going to be trouble for hitters. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to look into that stream after we wrap this up. But let me move on to my last guy today, number 11 on my list, guy I've been really high on for years, and that's Lonnie White Jr., outfielder. Keep hoping that this is going to be the year White stays healthy. 2023 was really the closest we've seen to full force Lonnie, part of the wildly Mm -hmm. strong 2021 draft class. Also a comp B pick, came out of Malvern Prep High School in Malvern, PA, pulling the uh, multi-sport athlete from a Penn State commitment. 1.5 1.5 million bonus uh, was going to play uh, football and baseball there, but decided to jumpstart his professional career in baseball. Unfortunately, he spent more time on the injured list than in the outfield, but when he's healthy, you can see why the pirates were drawn to him over 200 plate appearances in 2023 had an 883 OPS, eight home runs, 12 stolen bases, WRC plus of 140 in Bradenton plus speed above average raw power, Solid fielding uh, upside in the outfield. One of the uh, better all-around defenders in the outfield in the system. Entering his age 21 season, hoping he could stay healthy. Just turned uh, 21, I think December 31st was his birthday. Uh, But hoping that he stays healthy. And and if so, what are the expectations for Lonnie White in 2024? Presumably he goes to Greensboro, but like what? What is his path moving forward, catching up with his his peers and Salamito and Chandler and uh, eventually Davis in that draft class? Well, uh, speaking of Greensboro, it's going to be interesting, especially especially if, if he finally gets through a spring healthy and can kick off because he actually started off last year getting a surgery again. Yep. <clears throat> um, he he could absolutely obliterate Greensboro next year, which would be we'll be curious to see if he's doing as much damage as he's capable of doing, how quickly they were to move him. I mean, there's nobody blocking him at all, for one. Uh for two, I mean 
the he's he I, I'd say he's a pretty true like five tool player if staying healthy. I mean he can do everything. I really like him a lot. And one one of the things that was very promising because um, when he first moved up to Brandington, he was showing a little bit of a strikeout issue but with a high walk rate though. But uh, from August 1st to the end of the season, he only struck out 23.6% of the time while also walking 15% of the time. So it seemed like he shook the rust off and then it was blast off from then, then on. <clears throat> so a full season out of, I think he's someone that would could very easily creep on to uh, like the back end or like last three quarters of a top hundred prospect list by mid season if everything is clicking because he's he's got a very high upside if he's staying healthy and keeps keeps up what he was doing last year. Yeah, that's that's the big if, and it feels like there's a bunch of guys who, it, it that's kind of like the, the the cycle. They they get injured once, and then they kind of have mm-hmm. that that moniker attached to them. Like coming out of spring last year, people were like, "Oh, Jamar Johnson's injured. I guess he's going to be one of those guys." Um, mm-hmm. How how do these play? Brennan Malone, someone who wasn't drafted in the same class as uh, Quinn Priester in 2019 first rounder hasn't been able to stay healthy. And he's been someone who I've spoken highly about in the past. How do guys Mm -hmm. like, like what there's, there's nothing they can do when they get these freak injuries, but how do they kind Mm -hmm. of shed that whole injury prone uh, label? Get through a season healthy. (laughs) All right. Well, <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's yeah, it's it's tough because I mean, you especially go back to someone who I was very highly on, uh, Travis Swaggerty. I mean, he was you know injury yeah. prone, but I mean, the shoulders freak accident, and then the what, the migraines it, go, and yeah, the migraines and like you the issues you with his family. I mean, like yeah. You, that, you can't crazy. see that type of stuff coming and can't plan for that. And that's why to me, like an injury prone guy is someone that like has like a hamstring injury and just keeps re aggravating his hamstring again and again and again and again. Um, I guess the, the bad thing with someone that keeps getting these other freak injuries is just, you're just beating up the body more and more certain other surgery on the body and stuff like that. Um, but as he gets, further away from injuries you know certain injuries you know even speaking on someone like you know triolo had hamate surgery last year um so as he gets further away from that you know because that's supposed to sap power so hopefully there's more power progression after the fact so just hopefully as lonnie gets further away from his injuries and gets more bats in more consistency like i He's got a lot of upside. Yeah. I like him a lot. And, uh, I mean, the power with Triolo showed up in spades. I know Lonnie White's kind of had, like you mentioned, it's not like one specific thing. It's just been kind of a couple of things that have taken some time away. So the hope is that we're going to get a full season from him. So final question from you before we go to our outro. Uh, last week, I asked Murph the same question. Who is a prospect who is not appearing on top 30 lists, who you are most excited for. He said Omar Alfonso, catcher, who's in, I think, low A, Bradenton, or at least was last year. We'll see where he starts this year. Uh, who's that Who's that guy for you? Uh, I actually gave him crap for that. I was like, you picked a you picked a hitter? Like, come on. You're, you're, yeah. you're the pitcher guy. Um. I'm trying to think. I mean, what pitchers are left? What was he going to say? Sean Sullivan? I think we all know him. Was, that <laughs> was like an here, obvious one. I'll say anybody here knows me knows that I'm a big, big Sean Sullivan guy. But I um, set him on my list. I know uh, two two guys that were, were pretty uh, – I'll mention two names that we're both actually pretty excited about uh, another year of development. Uh, Wilbur Dotel and uh, – Alessandra Urkelani. Okay. Those, those are two guys that we're very fond of. 
you you want to talk? I, I'm familiar with Ercolani. Played for yeah. Team Italy last year. Uh, mm-hmm. A little bit far down the, the ranks overall. Uh, what can you tell me about Dotel? Well, well, I guess both. Both. I'll just say, kind of in a sense, they're um, being at Bradenton's, you know, uh, park that has Statcast. We're able to kind of like watch their stuff. There, there are the two more guys that stamina is going to be very key for them moving along because um, they both have very high or mid mid high 90s fastballs that show uh, positive metrics that you like to see with like rising fastballs and generate a lot of swing and miss. Uh, Dotel's got a pretty killer slider too. And I want to say it was the cutter Mm -hmm. that Pipeline rated as one of the better stuff plus pitches for Urkelani going into Arizona Fall League. I don't remember exactly what it was rated, what the number on it was, but I, I, I want to say it was the cutter that they say was one of the best, better pitches of the pitchers in the Arizona Fall League, like leading up to it. But um, yeah, yeah they, they both got mid high. Wish he pitched more there. Yeah, <clears throat> but yeah, they both got mid high ninety stuff. Um, obviously, control is going to be um, important for them. But yeah, just mm-hmm. watching some of their, seeing some of their metrics over uh, in Bradenton. It's very dominating type of stuff that they have if they can maintain it for four or five innings. Because even just watching, we'll say it like like the uh, indu- uh, not induced vertical break, but just the vertical break in general. Because it, it, it won't show like induced vertical break on stack casts, but you can gauge somewhere in like the 10, 12 uh, vertical break range is going to have like that higher. Uh, vertical approach angle that you want to see on a forcing fastball, at least in terms of ride on a fastball. Mm-hmm. And they would sit in that range like earlier in the game when guys were just whiffing, whiffing, whiffing. And, but as the game went on, they started decreasing velocity and all that. They were getting hit a lot more. So, but th- those are two pitchers that I'm excited to see how they progressed over the off season. Yeah, and both, as you mentioned, have some control issues that they'll want to try to work through, potentially in the offseason, mm. backfields, or in Bradenton. I, I assume that's where both of them are going to start this year. I don't know if they... It's possible. They... I mean, I, I'd, I'd have to probably do like a list breakdown myself just to kind of see, because, I mean, there's going to be a domino effect with how many pitchers they have in the upper minors, so it's sure. possible. They, they could – I could see them going to Greensboro because, I mean, they both spent a full season in Bradenton, but it might just be one of those things where space. No space, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes how it goes. But, uh, all right, well, I've taken up enough of your time. Hopefully everyone enjoyed, and that wraps it up for this week's episode. I'll be back with hopefully another guest next week talking about picks for uh, 10 through 1 ranked prospects. Thank you, Nola, jumping on this week. If you don't already, subscribe, Bucks on Deck. Thanks for having me. Worth checking out. Uh, Follow Nola on X, Twitter, Nola Jeffy, N-O-L-A-J-E-F-F-Y. Find me on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. 412 Double Play on all social media. Continue listening to the show, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, Appreciate all the same. Subscribe so you get notified when we drop our new episodes. Uh, Check out the uh, work we're doing with SteelCity.com. Uh, links in the description and thank you again for listening hopefully enjoying this series i've been appreciating the uh everyone listening and, and the feedback i'll be back next week with my top 10 new guests to probably critique my choices but from all of us here at the 412 double play podcast thank you for joining us and let's go bucks